I'm Dennis Anderson, and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. We begin a new multi-part series, Lessons from COVID-19, with a look back at the flu pandemic of 1918 and its parallels and differences with the current epidemic. Plus, a global health policy expert joins us in studio with his views on what we have done well and what we could do better. And in this week's Voices of the Region, Mining News and Signs of Spring on the Iron Range. These stories and more coming up right now on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. I'm Dennis Anderson. Julie is off this week as we alternate hosting during the pandemic. The Duluth Catholic Diocese introduced its new bishop this week. The very Reverend Daniel Felton was named the 10th Bishop of the Diocese by Pope Francis. Felton is moving to Duluth from the Diocese of Green Bay, where he served as Vicar General. Felton will be installed as bishop at an ordination ceremony on May the 20th. The Minnesota Department of Transportation unveiled its 2021 construction projects for northeastern Minnesota this week. A total of $473 million will be spent on 20 new and eight continuing projects in the district. The largest project is the Twin Ports Interchange rebuild which will reconfigure the so-called can of worms over the next three years. A fiber optic project being installed in Ely's downtown area will bring high-speed internet service to over 200 businesses and residential locations. The project was supported by a grant from the Department of Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation and is being installed by the CTC Cooperative. The network will be up and running by the end of April and will provide internet speeds of up to one gigabyte. And Westman Arena in Superior will host a community COVID-19 vaccination clinic beginning next Tuesday, April the 13th. The clinic will be open Tuesdays through Saturdays from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Anyone age 16 and older can schedule an appointment through the Wisconsin COVID-19 vaccine registry. And now on to the first installment of our special series, Lessons from COVID-19. This week, multi-platform producer Ramona Morosas sets the stage by exploring the historic impact of the pandemic to this point. And we look back to compare lessons learned from the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. God, yeah, we rarely learn from these things. Um... So, I mean, I mean, the 1918 flu is a great example. I mean, we, 2020, we did the same mistakes. We had the same issues of people believing in science. We had the same issues of people believing that the mask wouldn't work in all environments. The real visceral reaction to lockdowns in a very negative way happened today. You know, as a historian, we were, we were kind of right there with the public health officials and epidemiologists in that we expect pandemics to happen. Keeping something like this in the historical memory is really important. Um, in many ways, the 1918 um, Spanish flu, you know, was kind of there, but it wasn't at the forefront of people's minds. And I, 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 don't, I don't want COVID-19 to, to, to be you know, push back in people's minds and, and be forgotten about in a, in a generation or two because it'd be nice if, if this didn't happen to this extent uh, again. I just thought that was something, you know, that happened in the past that modern medicine and stuff would, you know, would relieve us of that burden again. And yet, here it was. This is an historic event we will be talking to our kids about later. I'm Dan Hartman. I'm the director of the Glenching Mansion here in Duluth, Minnesota. Um, but I will say in my past life, I also worked for the St. Louis County Historical Society, which is probably where a lot of the information we'll talk about really came from. Until the pandemic, you know, a lot of people really didn't know much about the story of 1918. And now there's been a, a huge new push of people to learn that story and then compare it to today. And there are a lot of interesting elements in that mix. 
if you lived in 1918, your memory of that year is this horrific fire that killed 500 people in a day, this Spanish flu that you had a lockdown half the town for, this, the end of World War I, which, you know, that isn't a, a pretty sight either. And so all three of those events are extremely tragic for people living in Duluth. And the Condons are living here at Glensheen when the flu happens. And so Clara, day by day, describes the different family members that she has that are going through the flu then. When you read the newspaper record back then and you see Clara talk about it too, no one can go to the theater, no one can go to church, no one, you know, can, they're on lockdown just like we went to lockdown now. But uh, instead of it being a state mandate, it was a city mandate. I did a journal a lot. I don't normally journal. You know, like I, I know a lot of my history friends who have journaled now who never have done that in their life. But they did because they knew like, okay, if I want to know about this later, I better start writing about the day to day. We're so eager to believe that science can solve everything immediately. And as is true in 1918, as is true now, science is, is a human thing and we're getting better at it and it can do a lot of amazing things. We just, we as a population just shouldn't believe that it's gonna solve everything immediately. I worry about the whiplash from this, of how many people will believe less in science because it couldn't solve it immediately. I think you're gonna see a lot more funding be available for pandemic response in general, regardless of whatever administration politically is in power, and in the short term. I'm Brenda Child. I'm Red Lake Ojibwe from Northern Minnesota, and I'm a professor of American Studies and American Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota. I do see similarities between this pandemic as well as other pandemics that have been uh, kind of part of human history. A hundred years ago, it was World War I, and there was this global circulation taking place during that era. And so we see that this is why we, you know, think of it as the first modern global pandemic, because of the way people were moving around in the world during World War I. This was something that was experienced in Europe, in Africa, in North America, in Latin America, similar to what we're seeing now. I don't think we had been thinking that, you know, something horrific like this is going to happen anymore. That's something of olden days. And so I think we were in some sense unprepared, except people in the CDC and in government who work on disease knew full, full well that we are vulnerable to events like this. This is a photograph of 1918 of the drill hall within the armory right after the, the big uh, Moose Lake Cloquet fire pretty telling image of what was going on those uh, October 1918. Not only is it refugees from the fire, but uh, about half the people have cloth masks on. I'm Jimmy Loverin. I'm a reporter with the Duluth News Tribune. I mainly cover energy and mining, but about a year ago, um, I, I decided, you know, I, there was a barrage of this talk of just never going through this before. And I felt like it was important to tell the story the last time Duluth went through something like this. It was a long time ago in 1918, but Duluth's been, you know, the whole the country world's been through a pandemic before. And, you know, the, the fears, which ended up becoming reality a few months ago of hospitals being overrun. I mean, that happened in 1918. St. Luke's and St. Mary's added annexes and used churches and other buildings to expand capacity and, and were quickly overrun. Duluth was kind of at a disadvantage in that it dealt with the fire, literally, you know, the day after they closed buildings. And so thousands of refugees flocked to, area, you know, Superior. Here at the Duluth Armory, they all came in. Unfortunately, that made the spread of the flu so much worse. It was linked to the spread of the flu. A lot of the fiery recovery efforts um, accounted for many of those, those cases in October and made October pretty bad compared to what it could have been. There were studies I, th I remember cited early on in the pandemic that said, hey, you know, this city chose not to have that parade welcoming back troops from World War I, but this city did. And the city that, that held the parade, you know, had a, had a worse flu outbreak. And so there were lessons there that people were, were talking about. Duluth, you know, chose to go the route of not banning 
football games, which was, you know, I think the thought, it, it is safer to be outside, but they were bragging about how busy the football game was and how packed it was. It was just odd that back then, you know, they, they insisted on carrying out these events. And unfortunately, I think we haven't learned that lesson now. Um, while many things were canceled, a lot of things went on and a lot of things uh, helped spread this. My name is Mark Poirier, and I'm the executive director of the Armory Arts and Music Center. This image is right here, right in the drill hall of the Armory. And um, we're, we're looking back from the balcony there. Somebody was probably a reporter back in 1918, was up there with a, one of those big box cameras taking a picture down here of all the activity. You know, not everybody is wearing masks. It wasn't something universally um, thought of, obviously. After the, the flu in 1918 came the Roaring Twenties. And, you know, I, I just wonder if there's something about the society, they had all this pent up, you know, emotion that they just had to get out after seeing so much death and, and destruction from World War I and the Spanish flu that they just felt it's time to be alive. So uh, maybe that's what we'll find and that'll be the, the silver lining of all of this. And I'm sure we're all looking forward to that day. So what have we learned that we can take into the future and inform our decisions for the next pandemic? And what could we have done better to avert the massive impact of COVID-19? Joining us now with his thoughts is Jeremy Ude, the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts at UMD and a global health policy expert. Jeremy, thank you so very much for being here. Tell us, what has the government done well trying to control the pandemic? You know, if you, we look at the rollout of the vaccination program, that in a lot of ways has been a su success. If we look at how quickly the government has been able to get those doses, doses out there and the level of uptake of those doses, that's been a really remarkable success. But on the flip side, we've had to be so successful at that because we did so poorly in the early stages. So we need to, to make sure that we do the vaccinations well because otherwise we're kind of out of tools to, to really control this. Have we seen and experienced more vaccinations quicker than perhaps you expected when all of this began? Absolutely. If we look at previous attempts to develop a vaccine, the record before COVID-19 was four years mm. uh, for, for a mumps vaccine. So I was actually very skeptical that we'd be able to do it, but fortunately there was a good amount of collaboration that was happening. There was a lot of government support both here in the United States and in other countries. And there was a, a real imperative that this, there, this is something that, that we need to, do, um, to work on quickly and use the knowledge that we have from previous epidemics like the SARS epidemic yeah. and others to uh, inform our vaccine development process. What can we expect in the future regarding other pandemics. This isn't going to stop. We'll have health issues forever, won't we? Absolutely. We, we know that there will be pandemics in the future. We just don't know when they'll happen. We don't know where they will start. And we don't know if it will be a disease that we've seen before or something like COVID-19 that we had never before experienced. Yeah. What's the major thing you think we have learned when it comes to trying to fight and doing battle with future pandemics? I would say the most important lesson though that we've hopefully learned is that we have to cooperate. This has to be a, a, com, a communal effort and not just within the United States, but also globally, because we are only going to be as protected in the United States as other people in other yeah. countries are protected. So there has to be that cooperation. Speaking of cooperation or even lack of it, why do you think so many people don't want to get the vaccination? You know, I think there are there's some skepticism because it was developed so quickly. Some people have some skepticism about um, whether or not it's safe. There's some question about just the questions of personal liberty. You know, my choice to, to make the The government decisions. can't tell me what to do. I, exactly. And there I, I think there's also just a sense that you know, we don't know exactly what the longer term consequences of the, the, this could be because yeah. it, it is something that has been authorized under an emergency use authorization, but it hasn't gone through the same sorts of, of processes that we'd see for a normal pharmaceutical. Vaccines were developed very quickly. To what do you, uh, and to what do you uh, attribute the speediness of developing these vaccines? Well, one thing is that, that we're fortunate because COVID-19 is related to SARS. And so we already had a good 10, 15 years of people doing research on SARS. So, so it was something that, that was, was known in that respect, but there was also a really good amount of information sharing in the early days. The scientists who started working on this, these vaccines were sharing the information about the genome, about their strategies, what sorts of, of techniques they were trying to use. And so you had this great collective brain power that could work together all across the world and could do it on a much more accelerated schedule mm -hmm. than we might see otherwise. Some of our viewers might be asking themselves, 
Okay, so how effective are the vaccines? They are very effective. Um, what we have seen is for most of the vaccines that, that have been approved, we're looking at, you know, the, at something in the 90% range. The, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is somewhere in the 70% range. And um, you know, they have to show a high level of uh, efficacy in order to get that approval from, from the Food and Drug Administration. So I just got my second dose of, uh, of the, the vaccine mm -hmm. today, and I'm really excited about it because even if I were to contract COVID-19, it is still possible that someone sure. who's fully vaccinated right. could contract it. The likelihood that you're going to become seriously ill, need hospitalization, or even, uh, heaven forbid, die, is dramatically, dramatically yeah. lowered. So how can the government do a better job than Jeremy, try to convince the public that this is the thing to do? One thing that, that can be really important is modeling the, the sort of behavior. And this is something that we've started to see more and more of where you have political leaders, celebrities, sports leaders who are showing the pictures on social media of them getting their, their vaccinations or talking about why they're doing that. And it's been interesting in, in the last few weeks to even see some Republican leaders who, they, you know, there's been some, some high degree of skepticism among uh, Republican males in That's particular. That's what I understand. And there have been a number of Republican leaders who have come out and said, I got the vaccine because I want all these restrictions to be lifted. I want us to be able to go back to normal. Yeah. I think that actually plays a big role. So quickly, are we beginning to see the end of the pandemic? I, I really hope so. We don't know exactly what's happening with these, these variants that have popped up, but the more people are getting vaccinated, the more we continue to wear the mask, the more that we, we follow these proper behaviors, the more we could be on the yeah. verge of moving to something more normal. Jeremy, I can't thank you enough for being here tonight. Jeremy, you at UMD's College of Liberal Arts. Thank you so very much. Thank you. you well, next week, our special series continues as we explore tribal government response to the pandemic. We talk with Boyce Fort Band Chairwoman Kathy Shavers, the first female president of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe. We didn't vaccinate just our band members. We vaccinated family members, whether they were band members. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because we need to vaccinate as many people as possible. And how the pandemic changed day-to-day -day business on the reservation and what changes they've made coming up next week on Almanac North. It's time now for Voices of the Region. Each week we hear from an area journalist about stories making news in our region. This week, author and columnist Aaron Brown from Northern Itasca County is our guest. I don't think you're seeing quite as much interest in Greater Minnesota in the Chauvin trial as you find in the Twin Cities, just because of proximity to the events of last summer, uh, the death of George Floyd, the, the aftermath, the riots, the, the um, demonstrations, and all of the social upheaval that occurred as a result. I mean, we saw parts of that here in Northern Minnesota, but we didn't feel it quite the same way. It was often more of what we experienced through the media, through the internet. And so you don't see quite as much follow up here, though it's of interest. I do think people see the story differently, uh, frankly, because the relationship between community and police is a little different in greater Minnesota than it is in, say, Minneapolis or St. Paul. Uh, you don't have the historic uh, cultural distrust that is built up uh, between police and the community at large. Masabi Metallics uh, as a company is, is attempting to demonstrate before this end of this month, May 1st is the deadline to demonstrate to the state of Minnesota that this company can meet its obligations under the lease agreement with the state of Minnesota. And uh, at least recent media reports, comments by the company have indicated that yes, uh, some progress has been made. Some, for instance, taxes, uh, back taxes have been paid to the county. Uh, certain uh, lease payments have been made. And that's re real money. It's not the bulk of the money that's owed. It's not the certainly billion dollars-ish that the company will need to actually finish 
and put the plant into operation. Um, but there have been some indications that, uh, you know, the company claims it has an offtake agreement for the ore, for instance, which is a fairly nebulous claim um, that's been said before and other companies talk about things like that all the time. It doesn't always mean anything, but um, it is something that they can point to. Uh, the big question with Masabi Metallics is what kind of a market are they entering? On one hand, we have what looks to be a really, really promising couple of years ahead for, for iron mining and, and the production of steel. I mean, look at the profits coming out of companies like Cleveland Cliffs and they're doing quite well. Uh, but, so that would indicate a good demand for the product. But on the other hand, global capital is in a really weird place right now. It's been uh, roiled up and shaken around by COVID and the global economy. And uh, there's some question whether the kind of money that this company needs um, will be readily available to it, to a startup, a high risk company like this uh, going forward. Vic Power was the mayor of Hibbing from 1913 till 1923, roughly speaking. He had a year off in there. And as mayor of Hibbing, he was the first local uh, official, a prominent one, to stand up to the biggest company in the world at the time, U.S. Steel, which really dictated the policy of the mining companies on the range, on the Masabi, Vermilion, and Cuyuna ranges at the time. And, and so Vic Power is this really charismatic, interesting figure. But what was really interesting about the research to me is the parallels and really the importance of the story to today, to now. Uh, we were just talking about mining leases, uh, state mining leases. Uh, this question over who, who deserves a cut of what's in the ground in the state of Minnesota uh, who owns this or obviously the mines lease it and mine it and sell it. And so they derive a profit from that. But do the people of Minnesota deserve a certain cut of that? And what are the local populations, the towns, the schools here where the miners and the workers are? Uh, what do they deserve? Do they deserve a little more? And that's, that's, that's really at, at stake in really the history of the range. So Power in the Wilderness is a book that I'm writing for the University of Minnesota Press. It'll be out early next year. But uh, before then, filmmaker Carl Jacob and I are producing Power in the Wilderness, the podcast. And that is going to be out through Northern Community Radio, KAXE, uh, starting May 1st. But if you go to powerinthewilderness.com today, you can actually listen to the first two episodes, which are already there for you to listen to and if you're interested you can subscribe and hear some bonus episodes before they come out and the seasons are my favorite part of living in northern minnesota the fact that things change and there's a cycle and so i'm looking at the birds coming through the um, migratory birds but even the local birds are changing their songs you know just the hearing that the bird songs um, chickadees change their tune you know when it's mating season and so you start to just hear and experience the change in season in so many ways it's not just on a calendar but it's you know the ice out on the lake you mentioned the snow being gone it's it's very clear as snow around us um, there's some down deep in the woods but not much and then the frost comes out, the grass greens up. It's, um, it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. And soon we'll have buds and leaves forming. And I think that's about my favorite time is early budding leaves and the first notion, um, the first glint of green and the sunlight, that's the stuff that I, I really enjoy. Winters go around here. This one was a little light on snow for many outdoor lovers, but that didn't stop a pro snowmobile rider who got his start years ago at the Snowcross event at Spirit Mountain. Red Bull athlete Levi Lavalley spent time in Duluth earlier this year stunt riding through the city, creating an epic video. Sit back and enjoy, and a reminder don't try this yourself.
<laughs> what a ride. He might need a pilot's license. Keep up with the latest from Almanac North by following us on social media. You can check us out on Facebook and Twitter or visit the WDSE website for the latest program updates, news about the station, and our upcoming events. And download the PBS video app for on-demand viewing of your favorite programs. Thanks to our guests and the crew here in the studio, I'm Dennis Anderson. Stay healthy, everyone, and be kind.